History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. This is Lecture 8, uh, Psychology, December 3rd, 1964. I imagine that quite a few of you, having heard me talk so much in these lectures about the concept of the objective historical trend, the world spirit, the way in which the subjective process comes to prevail, and the negative nature of the universal, that quite a few of you will have an urgent question on the tip of your tongue. Isn't all this a mystification of history? I would find it very easy to understand if you were to ask this question. After all, surely history is made, as has been remarked, by human beings. All historical events are tied to the human beings who bring them about. On the other hand, these events work themselves out at the expense of human beings. Human beings are the victims. History stretches its hands out over all human beings. I have intentionally phrased this question in a slightly blunt and primitive way, but there is no doubt that it deserves an answer in a course of lectures on the theory of history. And of course, this answer should take its proper, proper place in the context of what I have been saying. In fact, looking at it in architectonic terms, we might say that we have reached the precise point in our discussion when it would be appropriate to attempt an answer. I should like to begin by reminding you of something I have tried to impress upon you, namely the coercive nature of history. It is not just that we are constantly exposed to its blind, overpowering events and also its larger tendencies, nor is it just the fact that insofar as we act as social beings, as socialized beings, we act as character masks, to use Marx's term. By character masks, I mean that while we imagine that we act as ourselves, in reality we act to a great extent as the agents of our own functions. What a businessman calculates his option, or when a businessman calculates his options and takes his decisions, he is guided not by his character, but by calculations, his balance sheet, his budget, and his plan for the next business cycle in which the objective elements of the situation are concentrated. And other things being equal, the same may be said of almost all the functions that human beings have to carry out these days. Even the most powerful government minister will generally find himself limited to converting open files into closed ones. It is regularly the case. You can see this in any examination in the modest situation in universities, where the interest in making sure that the files are in order, that the co-examiner has not forgotten to sign the examination form and niceties of that sort, that the interest in such matters takes precedence over the candidate's performance. Moreover, it does so to a degree that would shock examination candidates if they were to witness it, although it might also make them smile, and this might help to relieve them a little of their pre-examination anxieties. But I do not want to talk about all this today, that is to say, about the way in which objective social necessities come to assert themselves. I want rather to discuss a specific factor that really focuses our attention on the role or place of human beings in the history that they allegedly make. What I have to say about this is that even in the realm in which, according to convention, human beings are really more or less in control, that is to say, in which they are not determined by their functions, but enjoy a certain measure of freedom, they continue to be determined by the universal. So much so that even the most specific, specific aspects of their individuality are performed by the universal. And this includes even those elements that diverge from the universal. Let me add right away, this influence is in general negative. In other words, individuals and even the category of the individual, which as you will recollect, is a relatively recent development, dating back only to the beginning of the Renaissance in Europe. Even individuals in the category of the individual, then, are the products of history. Given the nature of history, I would also ask you to reflect for a moment that this implies that the individual is also a transitory phenomenon. Please note that by individual here, I do not mean the biological division into individual beings, i.e. the fact that human beings do not come into the world like coral colonies, but as single beings, or at best as twins, or less well as triplets or quadruplets, with slighter chances of survival.
What I mean is that individuality is a reflective concept. That is to say, we can only speak of individuality where individual subjects become conscious of their individuality and sing singularity, in contrast to the totality, and only define themselves as individuals, as particular beings in the consciousness of this opposition. In this particular sense, we can say that the individual is a product, and, as I said, may be a transitory phenomenon. Of course, you should be aware that the natural form of individuation, that is to say the physical separation of individual people from each other, does in a sense enter into this reflexive concept, because the biological fact of individuality requires that just as people have come into the world singly, so they should perpetuate themselves as individuals. Singly. <laughs> Singly. So it is true that the notion of individual self-preservation, which is the central feature of individuation and also the development of individual character, does extend back into the realm of biology. In contrast, animals do not possess this self-awareness, and a fixed self as an internal authority has not become crystallized. The fact that animals do not have this self-awareness suffices to explain why individuality can be considered a reflexive category and thus the product of history. The process of socialization to which human beings are subjected by history, the process of inclusion in society as a whole, is one through which the universal realizes itself in history and so can be described as a historical process. Now the fact of individuation is not merely a matter of a conscious attitude towards the universal on the part of human beings. It does not resemble extreme situations in which, for example, a recruit submits to a hostile force, namely orders, drills, or orders, drill, or being ground down by adopting the slogan, man, you had better keep your head down, an attitude that enables him to survive as an individual separate from coercion at the hands of the universal. It is rather the case, and I believe this is fundamental to an understanding of the attitude of the individual human subject caught up in the historical process, that the historical coercion which molds human beings enters into the very core of their psyche, and their subjectivity is in a sense shaped by the socialization process. The sphere of psychology in which we imagine that we are ourselves is also the sphere in which in a certain obscure sense we are furthest from being ourselves. This is because we are preformed by that being for others to the very core of our being. This being for others is what is most successful in breaking whatever part of the existence of the individual that has not submitted to that identity coercion. By this I mean that the more individuals identify with the universal, not consciously but in their unconscious and pre-conscious reactions, the more they can be said to distance themselves in a sense from the universal by the fact that their identification with it is blind and defenseless because they are acting unconsciously as a form of adaptation. It has frequently been maintained with justice, I would say, that the realm specific to psychology is the realm of rationality. This is true of psychology as knowledge as well as, the, as, as, well as of the objects with which psychology concerns itself. I believe that we see here the explanation of this irrationality, that, it, that is to say, at those points where human beings strive to internalize the universal, the very thing that should harmonize with their reason, they almost always act irrationally. For this universal is directed against their conscious interests in the sense in which I have already discussed at some length, and which I shall perhaps be able to explain further during this lecture. This is because the identification with the universal cannot be achieved in any other way, through reason, for instance, which human beings nevertheless stand in need of if they are to survive in an irrational universe. For this reason, they can achieve their own socialization only in a way that is irrational, or even anti-rational in principle, or as we could say in clinical terms, neurotic, or as a consequence of repression or regression, or by means of all those modes of self-mutilation that psychology enumerates. The distinction between psychology and reason has an addition to its a subjective explanation, for example, in the individual resolution of the Oedipus complex, an objective historical explanation. Though, of course, the entire Oedipus complex could not be understood without the family and with it the authority of the father as a social phenomenon.
The irrationality of psychology assigns the irrationality of the course of the world to individuals against their own reason. This is the source of the peculiarity that is so characteristic of our own situation, but which presumably already featured in Hegel's proposition of identity. What I have in mind here is the constant illusion that reconciliation is a reality. In other words, the suggestion that, despite all the horror and negativity of which I have tried to give you a not wholly implausible picture, it always looks as if human beings and the course of the world that is imposed on them are truly similar in nature, are genuinely identical. It looks as if the world were so constructed as to be worthy of human beings, and as if we had no right to complain about the course of the world that has made people what they are. This is because what the course of the world has made of people is largely to ensure their affirmation of itself. It has modified or shaped their social character to the point where they are willing to sell their souls to the world, even where it is at its most irrational and where it exacts senseless sacrifices from them. People are forced nowadays especially to turn the realities that have been foisted on them into their own business simply in order to survive. And then Hegel comes along and glorifies the world spirit by asserting that it is identical with what human beings are, adding only that people are ignorant of this fact, and in this respect he is absolutely right. The only problem is that this alleged positive knowledge is in reality a negative. By this I mean that people simply do not know what the world has done to them, because if they did know, they would be different from what they are. And, and could not be turned into whatever it is that the course of the world has made of them. Incidentally, such concepts as the objectivity of despair or the objectivity of happiness can be measured against such things. That is to say, their objectivity is of the kind that might have broken through the illusion of identity that has been created by a painful process of identification that is consistently and necessarily faulty and unsuccessful, and cast it off. For this identity is completely misconceived. We may say that the measure of its failure is one we can see everywhere today. It takes the form of that infantility among adults that surfaces at its most extreme where the adults are at their most grown up. That is to say it manifests itself when they have rid themselves of the last trace of their childhood dreams and have completely surrendered to the business of self-preservation that has lost its ultimate purpose and become a fetish. At that point, the reason that has kicked over the traces, that has run wild and insists only on its formal fulfillment without following its rational purpose, merges with illusion and, psychologically at least, deteriorates into damaged goods. In a somewhat cynical passage in the philosophy of history, Hegel remarks that as a general rule, the course of the world ends up with people sowing their wild oats. His use of this idiomatic phrase suggests that he is distancing himself a little from this attitude, and in so doing and in the process of socialization, although he does not call it that, people find their proper place and their proper situation in life. This should be contrasted with a statement by a very significant figure who did not conform to the course of the world, even though he occupied a prominent position in it, more specifically in the world of art. I am thinking here of Gustav Mahler who struggled for years to do away with lax conformism, by which I mean the wrong sort of socialization, in the world of music, a struggle which was probably to blame in part for his premature death. Mahler said, and his answer just does seem to me to amount to a critique of Hegel, that the wild oats that we sow are really the best thing about us. It is my belief that when you two find yourselves facing the need to sow your wild oats, you should reflect on what I have been saying here. If you find that you can slow down the process a little, that might be far from the worst thing that could happen to you. But the disaster consists as a rule in the fact that people, today at any rate, in contrast to the still happy individualist times of the late 19th century, that people are all rushing to sow their wild oats. Or as I once expressed it in Minima Moralia, most people today kick with the pricks instead of against them. But when you make a remark like this, you only prove that you have become a grumpy old man who is naturally suspect to the serene young people of today. Even so, I should still like to point out to you that this false identification of an unreconciled unre universal with the particular is necessary in an ironic and negative sense. We are not dealing here with arbitrary subjective processes that can be avoided as long as you have a modicum of insight 
self-confidence, and critical spirit. A necessity rules here and you can count yourself lucky if you can keep your head above water long enough to recognize it and give it a name. But no one should imagine that he is immune to it or that a fortunate intellectual disposition can make him independent of such mechanisms. Psychologically, it is scarcely possible to make good the narcissistic loss, that is to say the constant injuries offered to the narcissistically driven instincts whose violence cannot be exaggerated. It exceeds everything that the imagination can grasp, and I would say that this is true of every human being, without exception, in the world in which we live. Why that is so is something I cannot explain here. These lectures do not deal with social psychology, and I am speaking today about the phenomena of social psychology only in order to show you their, their place in the framework of history, and not so as to provide you with knowledge of social psychology. That would be quite impossible here. But if people really were to become fully aware that their own selves, that is to say the point where they believe that they belong entirely to themselves, that their own selves belong not to them, but that they are right down to and including their idiosyncrasies and peculiarities, what might be called the negative imprint of the universal that would involve such a fearful loss of self-esteem as one tends to call it in bourgeois circles, that in all probability they would be unable to bear it. When I say that people's peculiarities are the negative imprint of the universal, what I have in mind are, for example, the widely ridiculed stereotypes of the, of the miser, that is to say the kind of character structure deduced and criticized by Freud. This structure is nothing but the mutilation, the deviation from the norm that arises because people are forced to develop certain character traits in the course of socialization. Given the striving for profit imposed by the universal, this leads everyone who consistently obeys that instinct to develop the deformations of pathological avarice. These can be seen in the novels of Balzac, for example, whose inexhaustible and precise imagination depicts them with all their nuances. This is just one aspect that I propose to you as a model. You will not find it hard to think of others. So what I am talking about today are these problematic identifications with the universal from a psychological point of view. That is to say, about what human beings actually mean for history in a specific sense in their inner composition and what the historical universal actually means for them. Without these problematic identifications with the law that governs them objectively, that is to say without the primacy of self-preservation in the forms in which this is reflected, the human subject would probably be unable to survive in this world. Whoever wished to exist immediately, absolutely immediately, without the psychological hardenings and stigmata through which we are transformed by the unreconciled universal, would be an entirely defenseless person, and probably a feeble human being without a self who would be completely helpless and powerless in the face of the world, an easy prey. The deepest reason for this is that owing to the socialization process, that is to say, owing to our adaptation to the social and historical universal, we are forced to renounce our instincts. Every day, at every moment, in a myriad of ways. We do so on the tacit assumption one that was criticized as early as the ancient hedonists of the Aristippian Cyrenaic school, that if we renounce momentary, immediate satisfactions, we shall prosper in the long run, that we shall eventually receive in full what we sacrifice now. In general, postponement in the basic model of social denial. The motto, jam tomorrow, never jam today, is the basic model according to which social and historical denial comes to prevail from the most intimate matters to the construction of entire societies which exact sacrifices from people on that pretext that everything will be just dandy in three or four generations, even though the people directly affected have no real reason to believe this. These promises, promises that are implicit in the social contract itself, that is to say in the exchange relationship, that we shall one day be compensated for our present sacrifices or shall really gain greater security. These promises are doomed to disappoint over and over again. There are periods, the present is one such, in which the disappointment is not so much in evidence, and where certain needs are satisfied relatively easily. At other times, this is less true, 
even in our own age, I would say, without being able to analyze it in detail here, that this fulfillment of the social promise in the future for what we sacrifice in the present by performing our social roles calls for a psychological surplus value that is squeezed out of us in addition to the ordinary economic one. This psychological surplus value is the difference between the expectation of happiness in the long term that is always being held out to us and the actual satisfaction that we generally receive. At bottom, of course, everyone knows what I am talking about here. Perhaps knows is not the right word. Everyone is aware of it subconsciously. People manage to come to terms with this phenomenon with the realization that their own rationality is irrational and that they do not obtain what their rational behavior promises only by making an irrational response. It is to accept the irrational course of the world, to identify with it and to make it their own. You can see this every day in discussions, for example, where people simply echo what others say and produce 100,000 arguments to prove that things can't be any different, won't be any different, and shouldn't be any different. It is as if they are inwardly prepared to take the side of whoever will prevent them from embarking on the course of action that would be best for them. This fact, too, is well known to analytical psychology, admittedly from a very limited, that is, an abstract, subjective point of view, but nevertheless a stringent one. Anna Freud, Sigmund Freud's daughter, has made a special study of these questions and has introduced the concept of identification with the aggressor or with one's own enemy. Incidentally, this should not be taken too personally as referring to one's own enemies, but should be expanded to one's identification with the course of the world, just as it happens to be. This sets up a catastrophic, vicious circle in which human beings have an objective interest in changing the world and in which this change is quite impossible without their participation. However, these mechanisms of identification have stamped themselves on people's characters to such a degree that they are quite incapable of the spontaneity and the conscious actions that would be required to bring about the necessary changes. This is because, by identifying with the course of the world, they do so in an unhappy, neurotically damaged way, which effectively leads them to reinforce the world as it is. And that, I would say, is the truth about the situation of human beings in history. This has two consequences for the theory of history, and I should like to summarize them for you briefly. On the one hand, the position is that the course of the world, which is hostile to human beings, asserts itself against them, but with their approval. In pivotal situations, it even prevails with their conscious self-destructive acquiescence. To explain this in slightly more concrete terms, I shall say only that, as you know, at its lowest and in terms of its potential today, democracy is a system that would like to give mankind the form it deserves. It is a social form in which people are the subjects and not the objects of society. Accordingly, it is the socio-political form that expresses the self-determination of mankind. Nevertheless, it is alien to the masses, and in critical situations, it becomes the object of hatred. It is alien because as long as it is purely formal, it appears further removed from people and more abstract than forms that at least appear to be immediately familiar and close by. The success of race theory, which is based on something as close as so-called blood relationships and ultimately the family, has exploited these elements by contrasting them with remote, objective mechanisms even though it is to these, to these that human beings are in truth connected. Its immensely profound appeal was based on the illusion of closeness that is echoed in such formulae as the term national community, and which went to the innermost core of the human unconscious. By speaking of the merely formal character of democracy, I have already suggested that in the world in which we live, the possibilities that might be open to mankind are denied them in reality. Instead, they have to make do with the illusion of alterity. However, so as at least to point to a particular socio-psychological mechanism by way of illustration, there is a tendency, one that ought to be carefully analyzed since it seems to be a constant factor for situations where possibilities of improvement are visible, but are denied to provoke the fury of those who are kept down. Where this happens, this fury is directed not against evil, but against the imperfections of the good which find themselves ridiculed as a swindle simply because people choose 
to identify with the inexorable course of the world as it is. An instance in the fury unleashed against so-called bleeding heart humanitarians by powerful populist forces proclaiming their yearning for the return of the death penalty. Given our current relatively peaceful domestic situation, this is a particularly frightening example of the mechanism I have in mind. On the other hand, since the achievement of a proper identity cannot succeed because of the objective course of the world, and because people's interests cannot be reconciled, people are necessarily crippled by this unconscious act of identification with the world. To an increasing extent, they find that they lose the inner spiritual freedom which would enable them to detach themselves from the course of the world. They find themselves unable to rise above it as free, autonomous, and critical beings. I can illustrate this tendency by referring you to an expression originally introduced to psychology by Carl Gustav Jung, but which I took the liberty of applying some years ago in sociology. This is the idea of concretism. This concept contains the idea of the displacement of the libido to what is immediately present to people's minds. Because they identify with the institutions, commodities, things, and relations immediately familiar to them, they are incapable of perceiving their dependence upon processes at some distance from them, the actual objective processes. By way of conclusion, the inference I should like to draw from what I have been telling you today is that, to a degree that is difficult to grasp, psychology has an immensely important role to play. This remains true even though objectively and compared to the objective necessity of history, it is only a secondary supplementary phenomenon. For were this not so, people would simply not put up with the situation as I have described it. Psychology has become the cement of the world as it exists. It holds together the very conditions that would be seen through rationally, if this irrational cement did not exist. This probably also explains why the most effective form of ideology today, namely the culture industry, is concerned less to transmit particular ideologies, propositions, and attitudes than to reinforce and reproduce in an unending chain those same mechanisms that enable people to identify with the things with which they are not identical. Thus, what I mean by this cement is the way in which human psychology has embedded the world in human beings in the form moreover, of a perverse, deceitful consciousness. It is a deformed consciousness that knows only how to yield. It is independent of specific theoretical or political ideas, which for the most part it never even begins to formulate. Nevertheless, this consciousness is the only form in which ideology really survives today. Thus, the form taken by ideology and by the false identity of subject and object in a world of radical discord is one in which a conscious, unconscious state is produced in people, both objectively and with their own connivance, and the aid of their own instincts. This state of mind blinds them to the unreconciled nature of life and leads them to accept and adopt as their own the very conditions that they feel to be their exact antithesis. And this, ladies and gentlemen, may perhaps explain to you why, in a theory of history or a theory of society that is basically objective in nature, such a subjective science as psychology, which as you will know is commonly traduced in Russia, is able to make such a crucial contribution. Its task is to analyze the cement, the ideology that exercises such immense influence over human beings, and is thereby able to re reproduce the entire global situation. We may conclude then that this brings me back to my starting point, that at the very moment when people believe they are most themselves and belong to themselves, they are not only the prey of ideology. We might even go so far as to say that they themselves have turned into ideology.